And joining us today on the MetaShare guest line is Indiana Pacers assistant coach Ronald Norred. He's a former Butler point guard who played in back-to-back -back national championship games and was a two-time Horizon League Defensive Player of the Year. He got into coaching right away after college and spent time with the Boston Celtics, Northern Kentucky, the Long Island Nets, and was an assistant coach with the Charlotte Hornets from 2018 until 2021 before joining Rick Carlisle's staff with the Indiana Pacers. Ronald, it's so great to have you back on Unpacking It. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's glad to be back. I feel bad, you know, like out of all the jobs I've had, people that anybody that has to read, like all the jobs I've had, it's like over and over and over. It just doesn't stop. So sorry about that. <laughs> that hey, that's all right. And you're still a, a young guy and you're you're just getting going. So that, that, that might, this might, might grow a little bit, but but you're, you're settled in uh, with Indiana. And so I want to talk about that uh, today. But before we do that, just curious your approach to the NBA playoffs. Unfortunately, the Pacers aren't in it this year. But yeah. do, you, do you watch a lot of the games? Do you watch them live? Uh, what, what's your approach? Yeah, I watch them here and there. Um, you know, our season obviously is over, and so it's a good time just to be with the family and, and hang out. So, you know, I have a four-year-old daughter and a 15-month-old son, and so we got activities going on all day. And so if I can be sitting down in front of the TV for the playoffs, great. If not, and my kids are in my face, you know, uh, great as well. So that's usually, that's what's happening lately. At night, it's a little bit better, obviously, because the kids are asleep and we can just sit on the couch and turn them on. Absolutely. And just based on who you guys played this year and throughout the season and, and now being in the playoffs, is there a team you're most confident in or, or a team that you feel like is this is their year, they're equipped to, to make a deep run and, and win the thing? Yeah, I don't. I don't know if there's any. I have a strong leaning any e either way. I mean, the the Nets are clearly the best seven seed ever, right? Mm -hmm. Like, okay. I mean, they got to be. I don't know if that's a fact, but they got to be close. Absolutely. Um, so tough, tough first round matchup for Boston. Although Boston obviously won Game One, um, you know Boston's good. I mean, Milwaukee obviously is is still really good um, in the East. Brooklyn. Um, uh, Philly, the way they're playing against Toronto right now, they're playing well. I mean, Miami, you know, they're like the number one seed that no one ever talks about, right? Like, yeah. uh, but they're good. And then the West, I mean, Memphis, although they lost game one, has just dominated people all year, as has Phoenix. I mean, I, I really think, you know, Golden State, like, it, it's really a toss up. There's a lot of really good teams. I don't think there's one that's just superiorly better than everyone else. So I think, I think that makes a good fight. That'll make a good, uh, a good playoffs. Absolutely. As a fan, I'm I'm fired up, excited to continue to watch the, the series after series and all the different storylines. And it just seems like so many great young players. And then you get the veterans like Chris Paul still in the mix. And, and so it's uh, a lot of intrigue for sure. But for you, you're in the offseason. And, and so I'm curious, just as an assistant coach, what are the responsibilities in the offseason? And then what do you have planned as far as fun and family time and vacation? Well, um, I, I don't know if I should give like the, the politically correct answer or the real answer. I'll give the real one. The real answer is we got nothing going on right now. I love it. Um, so, but, but that's good. You know, and, and most organizations that are done now are doing the same thing. Um, you know, per the, um, the, uh, the uh, Players Association rules, we can't force them to be in the gym at any time over in the off season. Um, wow. We can encourage them to be there. A lot of guys do obviously because they just want to get better. They want to work with our coaches. And so we will do that here in Indiana as well, but that's a couple of weeks down the road. So until then it's time really just to relax, just to be with the family, um, take some trips. We're, we're actually uh, flying to Charlotte this weekend. Oh, you um, are. And we're going to drive down to Kiowa Island nice. um, for a week and then come hang out in Charlotte for a couple of days, um, which, which we're looking forward to. We really miss being in Charlotte. Um, we, we had such a great time living in Charlotte. So uh, and still great friends uh, there. So we're going to come down there and uh, we got a couple other vacations planned throughout the year. But right now it's, you know, the season is just so taxing and it's, you're just on so much, you know, to have the opportunity to just really to just abruptly stop and get a chance to refresh and recharge is really important. And we'll get back at it um, here in a couple of weeks. That's awesome. Well, well very exciting. And I want to hear more about the, the move from Charlotte to Indiana but but I am curious, just the, the life of of an assistant coach during the season, and and so being a, a young dad, and husband, and and 
wanting, as far as I know, you want to be a good family dad, family <laughs> man, and all that kind of thing. So, so how do you juggle that and 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 keep your your priorities in check throughout the season? Yeah, there's definitely a lot to do um, from the job standpoint, and the biggest part about it that that makes it toughest with the family is like we play every other day, pretty much, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so when, even when we're home, you know, I'm leaving at. You know, if if we if I'm not going to shoot around in the morning, I'm leaving early afternoon and drive down to the arena, and I'm there all night. And you know, my family comes to some games; they don't come to every game because you know I have young kids and <laughs> they need to go to sleep. Okay. Um, so that's that's probably the biggest balance is just like not being home. But on top of that is um, we have a ton of film to watch because there's because there's so many games. We always have something to watch, including our own games that we watch. So that's a that's a heavy part of the uh, of our schedule as assistant coaches. Um, for me over the years, really, since we've had kids, our daughter, our our oldest kid is four, our daughter's four. Since we had her, it's been about trying to find a a rhythm to be able to work as hard as I can with my work when I have work. And then when they're awake, um, my kids are awake to be with them as much as possible. Mm So I've kind of found that, um, over the, over the course of the last couple of years, we feel pretty good about it. Um, and I try to be really efficient at work, get home, you know, as soon as I can, so I can spend time with the kids. And then if the kids go to sleep, I, I whip my computer out and I work more. Um, so probably a little detriment to my wife there at times, but, uh, wow. but we find our time as well. That's awesome. Well, yeah, no, that, that sounds challenging, but cool to hear that you, you've got a good rhythm with it. And, and so now I'm sure you've had to make some some adjustments being on a on a new coaching staff, but but take me into the the decision and and, and you know, what what you can share with, with our audience today as far as you were here in Charlotte for for three years with the Hornets as an assistant, and then Rick Carlisle takes over as as the head coach in Indiana, and he he brings you aboard. So so how did all that come together? Yeah, it was it. First of all, it happened pretty fast, um, as as these things tend to do. Um, you know, I, I love Charlotte, love the Hornets. Um, everyone that I was working with there is, you know, such a great organization with great people that have really helped, you know, helped me grow as a coach. Um, um, but as this as the season ended and, you know, Coach Carlisle left Dallas, um, he, he had reached out to me and asked if I had any interest in coming um, with him after he got the Pacers job. And, you know, I, I was born in Indy. My mom grew up here uh, in Indianapolis. My whole family's here. I went to college here. So I have a lot of familiarity with, you know, Indianapolis. Um, And that wasn't like a big draw um, Mm -hmm. to me coming here, but the familiarity definitely helped as far as like moving your family to somewhere completely different. So we talked um, over the course of a couple of days, he kind of gave me what he thought my role was going to be. And I felt like it was a great opportunity to, to just continue to grow. Um, you know, it was a step up, um, in a lot of ways, uh, and, and my role and my, um, my abilities with the, what, what I need to do with the team and my ability to grow. And so, and it's with, I mean, it's with a legend coach. I mean, he's a hall of fame coach, you know, yeah. so to have the opportunity to learn from him, work with him, you know, my ultimate goal is to be an NBA head coach. Um, and he's had six guys from his staff be NBA head coaches. And so, wow. you know, I didn't realize yeah. that. Yeah, wow. he's 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 produced a lot of head coaches, um, and I, I say there's probably there's probably four, maybe five right now, current head coaches that work for him. I think four, current head coaches, and so opportunity to just learn from him um, was a big part of it. And so um, you know we did it, and we moved there in a crazy the crazy housing market, and wow. uh, we were so blessed to and to get the house that we did because we we couldn't find anything. I mean, houses were just going before we could even put offers in. So. It was a pretty smooth transition overall, um, and we're really thankful we did. We've had a good year here. Ah, oh, that's great to hear. Gosh, I love that. And and so, how did you? How were you connected to Coach Carlisle before joining his staff? Yeah, so not a really strong connection, honestly. <laughs> um, he, uh, Coach Carlisle, has worked with my agent before mm-hmm. with some other clients of my agents. And I think he just trusted my agent and, you know, um, they've probably, my name has probably been brought up uh, at, yeah. at some point. And so um, when that time came, he, you know, called me to gauge my interest. I kind of talked with my agent through it and, you know, here I am. Um, and now, you know, coach and I have a great relationship. That That's neat. And, and have you already, I'm sure, realized why he's been able to 
either, I, I guess, on one end, it's him identifying talented assistants, but then on the other end, developing them to become head coaches. So can you see just kind of what he does uh, to, to pour into you as an assistant coach to, to set you up well? Yeah, he's fantastic. I mean, he's he's humble enough. You know, this was year 20 as an NBA head coach. Wow. And so um, I think in year 20, you know, he probably realized like, you know, I don't have all the answers and I don't need all the answers. Right. And so the thing that I love about him the most is that he allows his assistants to work. He gives great responsibility and allows you to grow in that responsibility and it refines you. It makes you better. Um, you know, he um, he has his opinions on how things should go as he should. I mean, he's the head coach. And so being able to come with him, come to him with ideas and thoughts, the thing that I love about him is he'll say, yeah, it's a great idea. Let's do it. Or he'll say, no, I don't think it's a great idea. Let's try something else. Um, <laughs> and some people, you know, as simple as that sounds, that's hard for a lot of people to do. You know, there's a lot at times there be there's feelings or emotions attached to bringing something to someone where they may be offended. You know, you don't think I'm doing this well enough. And he he's not like that at all. Mm. Um, he really just takes your ideas um, and he weighs them to where, you know, you're bringing it to him at, at what point in the season where we are as a team and he either runs with them or he doesn't. And I think that's great. And it, it really makes us better as assistant coaches. Oh, that that's neat. And yeah, I'm sure I, I'm, I'm just, yeah, I'm intrigued by the, the whole uh, dynamic with, with NBA <laughs> coaches and, and assistant coaches. And to me, it's almost like an untapped, I, I don't, I don't hear enough about it. So that's, that's, I appreciate the, the insight there. Of course. Um, and, and you mentioned wanting to be uh, an NBA head coach. That's, that's the, the, the dream job. And we see in kind of all sports, young guys are getting jobs. And, and I, I, from what I gather, you're, interviewing even for head coaching jobs throughout the throughout over the years and, and that kind of thing and keeping your name in the mix. So, so what is that balance like for you in regards to pursuing the dream and, and, and taking the next steps while also being patient and, and ultimately trusting God's timing to, 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 to know that he'll open up the door uh, as he sees fit for you. Yeah, that that's mostly an internal battle more than an external battle uh, for me. Um, I've improved at it a lot over the years. It used to be it just it used to just drive me, you know, try to just make everything happen to get to that point. Um, yeah. And I think uh, I think God's really put some people in my life to to help me understand how important it is to be really good where you are mm. and how he'll take care of everything else from there. And so I, I've really gotten to that place. Um, and, and being in a place where I want to learn and grow as much as I can, more than just thinking I need to be an NBA head coach or be a head coach, you know? Um, and there's been, I've had some really good people, like I said, in my life that have really helped me see that there's a woman on our staff right now named, uh, Jenny Busek, who has been a WNBA head coach. Um, she's been in the NBA for the last, I think Brent, maybe seven or eight years. And she just speaks wisdom to me all the time. And mm -hmm. one thing that she says often is you don't want to take a head coaching job before God has prepared you for the job from your, from a character standpoint, mm -hmm. because it will just, <laughs> it will just, it has all kind of uh, negative consequences to it. Yeah. And so she's like, God's timing is perfect. And he will have you ready for that job when you are ready. Don't, you know, there's no need to try to make it happen. And so that's been really good for me, especially, you know, in this season as I'm, you know, kind of taking, you know, more steps forward and, and been blessed to, you know, go from Charlotte to uh, as, as, as one spot in Charlotte to a spot up in uh, here in Indiana. So, um, like I said, it's more of an, an internal battle than an external battle. That's right. No, it's I'm a, a spiritual battle in many ways. That make that makes sense. Well, you've you've landed in the NBA, and and you you mentioned an NBA head coaching job, and and you're a, a, a great college basketball player. You were a great college basketball player. So, what about the difference in the games that you're at least at this point more drawn to the NBA, and and that's where you find yourself? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. Um, and you said great college basketball player. I, I think that's I think that's saying a lot. I wouldn't call myself great. I would say <laughs> I give myself you know decent role player on a good team. But um, but to me, guys, game, well, another thing, guys that stay yeah. four years, I always give more credit to anyway. The guys that come for well, one year, 
I don't care what the numbers are. If you're there one year, get, get, forget about it. No, but anyway. Well, the, the problem with us guys that stay for four years is that we have to. We don't we don't have uh, another that's choice. Fair. That's fair. There's <laughs> part um, of that. Part of that. But I, I love the college game and and I would be interested in um in coaching the college game if the right opportunity came about. Um for me, it's about the people and you know who I would be working for, um, university or organizationally uh in the NBA. Um, but being in the NBA, you know, this is where I've cut my teeth. I've, I've been a college assistant for, for one year. Um, and so being in the NBA and loving this game and knowing this game and being around the best players in the world, uh, is something that's a lot of fun. And just being in that, you know, for lack of a better term, pressure cooker of working with these guys is something that really, uh, it really shapes you and forms you. And it, it really puts the pressure on you to, be the best you can be all the time. I think college does the same thing. Um, it's just a it, it's just a different game. You know, there's different focuses for the head coach, and and those are great focuses as well. You know, in college you get to, you know, get young guys. You know, they're going to be there for four years. Well, with the transfer portal, you don't these days. But um, you know, you're going to have the opportunity to have them there for four years, and you're in their lives. You're seeing them. You're helping them with class and things like that. And that's that's very intriguing to me as well. Um, but there's something special just about the NBA. Um, and, you know, there's only 30 head coaching jobs in the NBA. If you become one of 30, that's uh, that's a pretty high achievement. So uh, if I ever had a chance to do that, I would I would definitely be really grateful for that opportunity. Oh, that's neat. No, it's, it's good to, yeah, be connected on on both both uh, games. So, uh, so that's pretty cool. Well, as far as you mentioned, the, the pressure cooker of the NBA, to me, the other – challenge with 82 games it's a lot of losses even even the top <laughs> teams it's a lot of losses uh throughout the year and so and and you've been on maybe a couple teams that have had down seasons recently but but how do you especially from a faith standpoint and and dealing with the uh you know the failures the losses and 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 being able to to keep going and, and keep your uh your, your faith and composure and character through through the, those situations yeah, that's uh, another really good question. You know, I think as a as a coach in the NBA, you understand you're you're not going to win every game, right? It's just not going to happen uh, out of 82 times, especially if you're not one of the top teams. Uh, I think we lost 57 games this year, which is a lot. Uh, that's a that's a lot of coming in the locker room and like, well, guys. Um, but you know, I think if you look at every loss as a growth opportunity, um, I that's got to be the way that you do it. Otherwise you're just going to, you know, drive yourself into a hole. Um, and so for us, number one, understanding we're not going to win every game, but number two, how can we learn from this game? Um, the biggest, I think the the most difficult thing with losses is to help the players keep moving forward and wanting to keep moving forward and not getting down on themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so being able to be the light in the room, I think is so important um, because it's easy for players to get in their head or they're not playing well or we're not playing well and, you know, to make excuses as to why we're not playing well. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's important to, um, to be that light, to be in their lives, to, to understand what makes them tick, um, to have strategies and ideas um, about how you're going to get better and to help them see that and understand that. Um, knowing, yes, you know, in, in, in the moment, this isn't great, but it's preparing us for something down the road, right? It's like any adversity that we go through in life. Um, in the moment, it's not great, but there's there's so many times where I look back at my life and, you know, I remember crying because the um, head coach at Western Kentucky left Western Kentucky to go to South, to go to South Carolina while I was committed and signed to go play at Western Kentucky. I remember crying as a senior in high school saying, I cannot believe, you know, this is happening to me. Well, then I end up at Butler and then we go to the final four and my life is <laughs> completely changed. That's a complete God thing, but that's, that's, that's adversity. Right. And so um, it's important for us and, and our job as coaches to help the players see how we can turn an adverse situation into something bigger for us this year, that was 57 losses. So how, you know, how can we turn 57 losses into something good for the future? That's something that we constantly think about, talk about, help our players see and understand. Absolutely. And, and I, I think Indiana's building something special and you're, you're a part of that with a lot of great young talent and some trades that happened this year that, that set you yeah. guys up well. So it's, it's, it's going to be fun to see the, the development there. 
the downside is my, my Hornets are, are right there in the mix with, with the Pacers <laughs> trying to get over the hump and be, become one of the top teams in the East. So we'll, uh, I know. we'll, we'll see. It, the East is getting more and more difficult, man. It's just, it's, you know, everyone used to say, oh, it's the West, it's the West. But man, the East is loaded. Loaded. To, to think loaded. the Knicks were in the playoffs last year. They miss it this year. They still got some great young talent. So they're, they're right there. Washington. So it's, yeah. uh, yeah, it's it's gonna it's gonna be tough for sure. Tough. And really, tough. The, the teams that are in it aren't that old. I mean, maybe Phillies are a little bit older. But, uh, the Bulls, kind of, but maybe yeah. But really, no. You know, the Nets. The Nets are a pretty veteran team. Um, the Nets, but yeah. Miami's gonna be able to keep it rolling. Um, you know these these teams are these teams are good. <laughs> it's, it, it makes for a great great NBA. There's no, there's no yeah. question about that. Well, we'll talk a little more more faith with you. And in this this past weekend was was Easter, and I'm always curious, you know, just what what comes to mind, or or maybe this year in particular, was there anything that you you focused on, or or something that uh you you you, you just kind of noticed throughout the the build up to Easter, and and then Easter Sunday for you. Yeah, this is this has been a unique year for us because, uh, like I said, our daughter is four, right, right? and so her understanding of what's going on with Easter is, is really growing. And mm -hmm. so I think the biggest thing um, for us this year with Easter has just been teaching her, right. Going through the Lent season and, and um, preparing in her mind, preparing her for what happened on Sunday. And that's been a lot of fun. And it's been so fun to um, see how exciting, like on Saturday, there was, there's one more day till Easter. Um, oh. And talk about, you know, the, the true meaning of Easter and what it means for our lives, uh, right? That, you know, because she always say, Jesus, that um, she goes to a great school. So she, they're hitting her at school as well. But, you know, <laughs> she, she can easily say, you know, Jesus died on the cross. Uh, why? To save us from our sins. And, wow. and the great part to, to tell her is like, but the story didn't end there. It's, it's not over. Um, and so it's so fun to just talk about the empty tomb, right? And, um, and my wife had um, some, uh, um, what are they called? Uh, they're not Easter eggs. I'm, I'm blanking on the name of what they're called, but eggs that every day there's something, there's something in the egg oh, cool. that, uh, that's a piece of the Easter story. And, you know, um, the day the tomb was rolled away, it was, it was a rock that's in the egg. Well, on Easter Sunday, it was a white egg. She, she liked to shake the eggs and see what was in them. Well, it, it was a white egg. And she's like, I don't know if there's anything in here. Right. Um, well, when we opened the egg, it was on Easter Sunday. It was like, there's nothing in here because the tomb is empty. Ah. And, 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 you know, and so just talking to my daughter about what that means for our lives, how now, you know, Jesus defeated death and we get a relationship with him forever and we're going to get to go to heaven. And that's going to be this awesome party um, when we get there. And it's better than anything we can imagine on earth. And so that's been our, that's been our Easter and, and really, our build up to Easter was a lot through her excitement um, of what, what was to come. Ah, uh, that's awesome, man. I've, I've got a two and a half year old, so she's a little bit you know, behind, but, but to even hear her say Jesus and, and, and understand, okay, Jesus Easter. And it's, mm. it's special, man. It, it really it is. is. And, and it, you know, it gives us a, f a, a fresh look at the gospel and, and it's, uh, it's special. It really is. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. And that's, I mean, I, I had not, not that I need it, but I had so much renewed energy for Easter just through seeing it through her eyes. Right. Yeah. And, and literally every day, just being able to, you know, talk about the Easter story and, and explain what the gospel is to her has been, it's been a treat. Ah, uh, that's excellent. Well, beyond um, be, being a, a dad, what other uh, maybe lessons learned in your life? What, what ways has God been working in your life and, and teaching you different things and showing you and, and moving uh, in, in your heart and mind? Anything that, that you'd be willing to share today that would be an encouragement, just something that, that you've uh, either wrestled with or, or kind of grown in a certain area? Yeah, um, the biggest thing lately has been uh, – it has to do with being a dad. It's just being uh, his, his family. Um, I just read a, a really good book. Listen to the podcast first, but then read a book, um, um, Take Back Your Family by uh, Jefferson Betke. I don't know if you've heard of this book, oh. but. Yeah, I've interviewed um, him. Yeah. Oh, have you? Yeah. 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 He's, he's the best. Uh, That's cool. Not that I know him, but I just read his stuff. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But so uh, that book um, 
just talks about how in the Western culture, we're just doing family all wrong. Mm. And um, how um, in ancient, ancient culture, how the whole family lived together, the whole family dined together um, and, you know, talks about Shabbat and um, just being, um, just being uh, energized and having a plan for your family. And number one, and the biggest thing is your family being on mission. And mm -hmm. it's interesting because as a coach, um, that's what I do all the time, right? You're thinking about what your mission is for your team and um, you're getting your players to, you know, go on that mission together and, and, and you know, creating values of what that mission is going to look like. And as I'm reading this book, I'm like, this makes so much sense. Like I do this as a coach. I, love, I never even considered doing this uh, for my family being intentional about what specifically the Nord family mission is. And so uh, through reading this book, and, and he has a whole organization, they, um, him and another guy, I think Jeremy Pryor is the guy's name, that uh, created an organization called Family Teams. And it's literally the parents as the coach. And um, and so I read this book, I read it super fast during the season, which I don't read a lot of books during the season, just because of time purposes. I flew through this book and I'm like, I gotta start this now. And I have- oh, uh, Three, three friends that uh, that I grew up with that I'm really close with, and we talk all the time. And I was like, guys, we're doing we're doing this family thing all wrong. You guys got to read this book. And you know, I think I sent a 12 minute video to them of like explaining this book, and they and they were probably like, dude, this is way too long. But I was really excited to be able to be um, an intentional family and our family be on mission. And a big part of the book talks about the generational family, how families, how the generation used to be so important that the kids knew the great grandparents and the grandparents and how strange it is in our culture that, you know, we get excited about being empty nesters when the family should be together all the time or how it's normal for us to talk about the brother and the sister don't like each other or they like their friends more when the brother and sister should be closer than any other or the, the siblings should be closer than anybody else that they know in their lives. Yeah. And so they have all these family teams and Jefferson Besky through this book, they have a lot of strategies to create this generational family and a family on mission. And so that's something that's coming up for us uh, now that the season is over with that my wife and I are gonna sit down, create our family mission and be intentional about sharing that with our kids, helping our kids understand our family past, where, where you come from and building that, um, understand with the family. So then they can pass all this on for hopefully a long, long time to come. Gosh. Well, th thanks for sharing that. That's uh, that's an encouragement. And I'm intrigued by the book because uh, I've, I've enjoyed, I read one of Jeff Bethke's books uh, before. So that, that, that should be uh that should be a good one. And yeah, I'm just coming off Easter weekend. We had my, my wife's family on Saturday, my family on, on Sunday. It's, we all live in Charlotte. So I, I've experienced some of that, but I think even taking it a step further, with the intentionality of it and, and what, what you're talking about. And, and sometimes I either take it for granted or get burned out thinking, Oh, it's a lot of family time or yeah, oh, they're all right here, but actually viewing it as a blessing and, and view, all right, how does God want to work through this? Um, I appreciate that. So I could, I could yeah, it, it, a little bit. It, yeah, it's good. And, and he, he did the, uh, yeah, he did a podcast, um, with John Ty Tyson who's a pastor in, um, who's a pastor in New York, an Australian guy who's mm. a pastor in New York. And John Tyson writes about um, the intentionality of us working with our children. You know, what does it mean to be a man? And how um, so many of, in our culture, so many young men don't understand what that means. And they end up living with their parents and they're playing video games at 25 years old. And he talks about how, and, and with this podcast, they're together, but he talks about how he created starting at um you know when his son i think may, maybe was two creating a curricular curriculum for his son from the age of i think maybe 14 or 15 till 19 to where they he it was this journey that he took his son on and he did it there was a yearly things they did monthly and daily there was daily scripture there were daily questions there was monthly you know activities and they took him on trips but he said he wanted his son when he when he got turned 19 to know exactly why when and why he became a man and how he knows he's a man and just the truth behind it is like i mean it, it's right like you listen to it and it's like i can't do i can't possibly recreate mm. this but it's just about the intentionality that we have with our kids 
um, to help them grow um, in a way that is going to further the kingdom and um, and know they are who God says they are, not what the world says they are. Amen. Amen. Gosh, that's what I got that. coming up. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Well, I, I look forward to hearing about that. That's uh, that's excellent and uh, a cool adventure and, and, and challenge ahead of you. And I've got to look into that. So that, that's neat. Well, Ronald, before we uh, get going, I just have one final thing, just because I'm sure you get asked about it all the time. But to me, the whole concept of Brad Stevens, your former coach, you were on the, the bench with him as well as an assistant coach in Boston. He goes to the front office, but he's done a great job because he put together a great team this year and, and they're off to a good start in the playoffs. But but what did you make of the, the decision? How surprised were you? 100% surprised. Um, I heard that there was something going on, but I didn't know what it was. I was actually, we were in Charlotte. I was, um, we were in Matthews and yep. I was at my daughter's swim class. And, uh, and I was just, she was swimming and I was, you know, the teacher was going through and I was on my phone, like just kind of looking at Twitter. And I saw the tweet of Brad Stevens is becoming the president of the Celtics. And I was like, what? And a lady next to me was like, are you okay? What's going on? And I was like, oh no, I'm fine. It's just something crazy just happened. But what I didn't realize in the first, when I first read the uh, tweet was that he was leaving coaching. I thought he was doing both roles together. Yeah. Yeah. And so when I saw he was leaving coaching, I mean, I was, I was as shocked as they come. Um, but, you know, talking to him, it was a great opportunity to do something different, to be challenged in a new way. Um, you know, a, a job that he felt like he couldn't pass up on and he's done a great job at it. And it's been fun just to see how he is building the team and, and to talk with, talk with, uh, through some of it with him. Um, but you know, He's uh he's a great coach um and always will be a great coach. I I told him I was like, dude, it's weird for me to even see you as anything but a coach. Um yeah. but you know, he's a great leader more than anything else. So I know he'll be successful, you know, as he continues to do the job he's doing now. That's right. At least for now. At least for now. I can't imagine. At least for now. Be, uh, I can't imagine he's not back on the sideline at some point. But uh but that's it's a pretty cool, cool story. So pretty it's funny because cool people don't realize Greg Popovich. He was in the front office before becoming a coach, and his story's exactly kind of right. That's so, exactly right. Yeah, Brad doing the opposite there. But, um, well, Ronald, man, great having you on the show. Great catching up. Excited for your new opportunity, and, and can't wait to see what what doors God opens up for you down the line. But, but excited where you're at now, and and God using you right now. So, keep up the yeah. great work. Enjoy the family. Enjoy the vacations, and uh, look forward to the next time we get to catch up. Thanks, Bryce. It's uh, it's been it's been fun being on for a second time, and I uh, love all you're doing, and uh, glad I can be a part of it. So thank you for having me on. Absolutely, well, I appreciate it. Well, there's Coach Ronald Norred joining us here on the MetaShare guest line right here on the Unpacking It podcast.